All right. We are now at the final talks of the day. Uh, and the next talk will be by Chris McKee, who will talk about star formation through cosmic time. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's, I think everybody is uh, enjoying the fact that we can at last get together again and uh, talk. I also want to thank the organizers. I, I really like this organization where there's a lot of time, not only for the talks, but also a lot of time to talk in between the talks. So that's, that's good. So what I want to do is to talk about some work that I've been doing recently with Mandy Burkert uh, and to uh, understand better how star formation occurs in galaxies over cosmic time. And we've heard a number of talks today which have indicated, both on observational side and theoretically, that this is an extremely complex problem. Um, I'm going to just focus on one aspect of it which, and try to give you a fairly simple uh, picture for uh, you know, how we can uh, understand that. As we know, the uh, star formation depends on both the fact that you have to accumulate the molecular gas in which the stars are going to form, and then you have to determine how fast uh, that gas is going to be consumed. And that's the depletion time, and that's the focus of my talk uh, today. And I want to uh, look at it both locally and on a cosmic scale. And we're going to have some observational input, but the observational input is actually fairly well backed up by theory. So I'm going to uh, use both uh, the uh, observed star formation rate for pre-fall time. Uh, Mark and I, Mark Crummels and I uh, introduced that uh, some years ago, and we're able to estimate it sort of theoretically, and now they're uh, very good, as you'll see, uh, uh, observational determinations. And then also observed uh, sizes that we're going to take from Arjun's uh, work, uh, which he described a little a while ago, uh, which determined the angular uh, frequency. And that, too, has a theoretical backup uh, from Mo, Mao, and, and White. And uh, the, um, theoretically, we'll sh show that the pre-fall time in molecular gas is actually determined by the galactic rotation rate. And so with the combination of this star formation efficiency for pre-fall time and the uh, rotation rate, we'll be able to determine uh, the depletion time of, uh, for the gas. So first, let me do it locally and just look at the results that uh, Adam Leroy presented uh, some years ago uh, in which uh, he looked at the depletion times in 30 nearby disk galaxies. And he did it two different ways. He had uh, both looking at the sample of galaxies, and he had a number of lines of sight through it and measured in each line of sight what the depletion time was. And it went by weighting that that way with each line of sight, that meant that tended to give greater weight to the more massive galaxies, um, and uh, which turned out to have somewhat lower uh, depletion time. In fact, what he found was that the galaxies broke up into two groups. There were those that were less than 10 to the 10th, and they tend to have one uh, uh, set of uh, depletion times. And then those above 10 to the 10th had a slightly larger by a factor of uh, two or three. Um, but there was no mass dependence in between. Uh, that, that is, once you were in the large group, there, there was no change. When he did it by averaging over the galaxies, looking at these more massive galaxies, then he uh, got a somewhat uh, different number. But basically, that's around two gig years. And they pointed out there was a substantial uncertainty with this. But you could ask, why is it two billion years? What, what's, what is uh, causing that? If we want to, uh, we had actually, and uh, wrote with uh, Eve Ostreicher and Adam, uh, developing a star formation model uh, based on this. And for the molecular ISM, we had uh, just took this depletion time of a couple of giga years, and that was the star formation rate. But we wanted to go ahead and explain the star formation rate not only in the inner parts of galaxies, but at the outer parts of galaxies. So here, the black uh, symbols are the observation, and the red are our, our model. And the basis of this model was, at least in the outer parts of galaxies, we relied on the ultraviolet radiation that was produced by stars that then heats uh, the, the gas through the photoelectric effect. And the idea was is that if you uh, have too much star formation, then you will drive all the H1 to be warm and uh, you know, 10,000 degrees, and there uh, won't form any molecular clouds, you won't form any stars, and then it will cool down. On the other hand, if you uh, cool down too much by not having enough far ultraviolet, then the star formation rate will go up. So it naturally self-regulates, and as you can see, works uh, fairly well. So when we go now to uh, look at the problem of great interest in this conference 
is doing it over cosmic time. And here I'm showing one of the figures of this wonderful review that uh, Linda Reinhardt and Emil Sternberg uh, wrote. And uh, this shows the uh, depletion time uh, as a function of, of redshift. And they really assembled a huge amount of data. This is really a very nice piece of work in which they uh, had uh, 1,400 main sequence uh, galaxies and determined uh, what the depletion time was. You can either write it directly in terms of the number of years, or you can relate it uh, to the, uh, the Hubble constant. And these are two equivalent ways. But then you can ask, uh, why is that? And that's the question we want to address. So as I mentioned, we're, my argument is going to be based on the efficiency of star formation for pre-fall time, epsilon FF. And that is just defined as the, the star formation rate is this efficiency factor times the molecular gas divided by the pre-fall time. So then the depletion time is the mass of molecular gas divided by the star formation rate. So you can see just from the definition, this is uh, just the pre-fall time divided by this uh, efficiency factor. So if this efficiency factor is of order 1%, so that what that means is that it's what would take of order 100 pre-fall times in order for all the gas to get turned into stars. And what uh, we found in a paper uh, that Mark led and that Abishai and I uh, participated in was that, oops, yeah, was that the, um, uh, oh, if you go all the way from uh, Milky Way clouds, which are down here, these are the contours or resolved observations of local group galaxies. And then we also have Milky Way clouds. These are the red symbols. We have uh, disks and uh, starbursts uh, in the local universe. These are the black symbols and the blue symbols up here are the uh, high Z disk and starburst. And you can see that basically over many decades in this quantity of this surface tense divided by the free fall time, that's six decades, uh, the this star formation rate uh, goes uh, linearly uh, with that. And the coefficient is very small. So uh, this has been known for a long time that star formation is very inefficient and this just emphasizes it. But uh, it puts it in a very a clean way. And what we showed uh, a number of years ago was that this is a natural consequence of the universal process of su uh, supersonic turbulence in molecular clouds. Okay, so now let's relate the free fall time uh, in the galactic disk to the to galactic rotation. And there are two cases. Um, if you have a case like uh, true throughout most of the Milky Way, we have uh, uh, giant molecular clouds and you, the star formation occurs within these molecular clouds and you really have to understand the properties of the individual molecular clouds to get the star formation rate. In the, when you have a higher uh, um, surface density of gas, then basically the molecular gas is much more pervasive and what you can write is that the pressure in this uh, gas uh, which is just the density times the square of the velocity dispersion, is proportional to the weight of the uh, gas and, uh, above it. And you can then uh, relate that, the, uh, the weight of the gas, that's the proportional to the surface density, and then the, uh, uh, the, that's the, ma the mass, and then you have the gravitational field, which is, has another factor of g times that. But you also have stars that are exerting gravity. So that then puts the factor out here in front. And what Mark and I showed some years ago was that even in very different cases like the Milky Way and starburst galaxies, this factor uh, is of order uh, three. So that's the number that we'll adopt. And this, that, this case here corresponds to the um, high surface density case that uh, we and, uh, I and Adam uh, worked out. So most uh, galaxies in the sample of galaxies that um, uh, Mark and uh, Avishai and I worked on are in the second case, which we call the tumor case. And all the high uh, redshift galaxies are, so that's the case I'll focus on now. Um, so what we're gonna relate is the pre-fall time to the uh, epicyclic frequency. So as I just mentioned, in the, uh, the tumor case, the pressure is uh, determined by the disk pressure, so we have that. Then we have the definition of the tumor parameter, uh, Q, for a gas. And I want you to notice right away that we have a sigma uh, over proportional sigma gas, and here we have sigma over sigma gas. So what you can do is very uh, straightforwardly show that the density is just given by the, the proportional to the square of the epicyclic frequency divided by the square of the tumor Q parameter. Now I want to call your attention to the fact that um, most of these cases here, I have identity signs and not 
equal signs. And that's, that's quite deliberate. What I'm emphasizing is that this equation here, where I relate the free fall time to the tumor Q parameter and the epicyclic frequency, is entirely a matter of definition. There's no physics in it whatsoever. The physics comes in when you have to go ahead and say, well, what is uh, this, uh, the value here? You, that takes a, a lot of physics and observation, hopefully, which you agree, and it's only for the epicyclic frequency. So in the case that uh, we focus on here, where we set a Q equal to a critical value of order one, have a, assume a flat rotation curve, and set this uh, parameter that governs the pressure to three, then it turns out that the free fall time is about uh, a half uh, divided by the angular uh, rotational frequency. And so by definition, kappa TF uh, uh, times the free fall time really depends only on these two parameters, Q and P, which are uh, generally of order unity. Okay, so the depletion time in disk galaxies is determined then by the star formation efficiency per free fall time and the galactic rotation rate. So to show that, just recall that the uh, this star formation efficiency per free fall time can be uh, expressed this way, which is, as we saw before, just the uh, free fall time divided by the depletion time. So uh, this free fall time is very small compared to the depletion time, and this efficiency is small. We just showed that the uh, free fall time goes like uh, half uh, divided by the uh, galaxy rotation rate. And um, so this relation here is, you can ask, why is it that you have this quantity here? The free fall time is something you measure locally in the gas. You go out in the middle of the disk of a galaxy and you look at the density and you say, ah, that's the, what the density is. I've now locally measured this free fall time. On the other hand, if I look at the uh, uh, the you know, rotation rate of the galaxy, that's a property of the entire galaxy. And that's because what the tumor Q parameter does is it relates the, what's going on on a small scale. It says, you know, what is the maximum mass that can be stably held up against gravity uh, due to random motions. And then with the uh, tumor mass, that gives you the uh, minimum mass that is supported by uh, angular momentum. And if there's a gap between them, then that's... Uh, when the gap starts to open, that's when Q is 1, and that's when you can get gravitational uh, instability. So um, the, hence, just combining this, we have that the uh, depletion time is just about a half over omega epsilon uh, uh, prefall. And uh, I will notice that both these quantities here are generally measured at the half light radius. OK. So uh, you, since I've related the free fall time to the angular uh, rotation rate of the galaxy, I want to point out that this is not uh, brand new in the sense that for a long time people have talked about relating the star formation rate to the angular velocity. Uh, this, in fact, I th as far as I could tell, Frank Shu was the first to mention it, and then Wise and Silk and a number of people uh, since then. And that follows directly from what we just found, because if I put in this relation that the free fall time is a half over omega, into the, uh, the find then that the uh, star formation for free fall time goes like that. So this constant here, epsilon omega, is just going to be uh, this free fall time, uh, this efficiency for free fall time divided by half. Now, um, why do is it that you can say, well, why do you want to prefer the free fall time formulation as opposed to this uh, velocity uh, or angular velocity rotation rate uh, formulation here? And that then is a, a another figure from uh, the paper with uh, Mark and Avishai. And it shows trying to uh, go ahead and relate the star formation rate to the surface density divided by the orbital time, which of course is like one over omega. And you can see that if I'm way up here at extra galactic region at uh, large redshifts, then in fact it doesn't make any difference that it's the same as it was before. However, if you look at uh, galactic molecular clouds or in this region here, these resolved observations of local group galaxies, then you find that it doesn't work as well. So basically, I uh, we favor the, uh, using the free fall formulation because it's, it's more general. Okay, now what we need to do is we need to determine what omega is, uh, which depends on the uh, uh, radius as, you know, the, it varies as the square root of the mass in stars divided by the, uh, this effective radius cubed. So I use the data that uh, Arjun uh, referred to in his talk, and I just focus here on the late type galaxies, uh, and he, he has it as a function of redshift, going from a quarter to uh, almost three, 
and then for different uh, massive galaxies from uh, 10 to the 9.25 to 10 to 11.25 sets, two decades. And what I did was I just did a, a simple fit uh, for the median uh, values, and you can show that this uh, gives you uh, a, a result where the log is accurate to 11%. Uh, so that's what uh, we will use. Now, um, when Steve came out with his result for his uh, daughter's galaxy, I was immediately curious as to how well the uh, value of the radius that I calculated at much lower redshift and for much larger galaxies would work. And much to my amazement, and Steve said he was kind of uh, surprised also, the, uh, it turned out, and I've used his new value of the redshift now, so the, the uh, effective radius is from this formula is predicted to be about a half a kiloparsec, and the observed value is a little less than 0.4 kiloparsec. So I don't, this may be an outlier. You can't say that it's going to work at, uh, at redshift, but it was uh, amusing that it did. Now, you can also, uh, as uh, Arjun did, you can uh, express things in terms of the Hubble parameter. And so when I do a fit like that, I got uh, th this, this result here. OK, so um, then we can now in a position to predict the depletion time. So we have that the depletion time is this uh, 0.5 divided omega epsilon FF. The galactic rotation rate, and I'm making the approximation that the half mass radius is equal to the half light radius. Uh, which, as Arjun said, uh, th there's can be a sort of a 0.15 to 0.2 dex offset. Um, and then I'm going to want to relate it to the stellar mass, but of course the rotation rate depends on the total mass, so we have to divide by the fraction of the mass that's in stars. And uh, the, if I go ahead and take the value of the effective radius from uh, Arjun and use the average value that we uh, found for this epsilon FF, we get this result for the depletion time. And I've normalized this F star to one third based on results of uh, Roots et al. And uh, I want to emphasize that there are no free parameters in this. It's true that I've introduced some parameters like Q and phi sub p, uh, but those are in principle uh, measurable. And uh, I've used you know, estimates now, but they, those values can, and uh, we hope to actually Im improve their values. OK, so how do we compare that with observation? So I mentioned, uh, if we look at uh, Leroy and all 13, they got a depletion time around uh, 2 giga years with 60% uncertainty. So I then stretched that out. So our estimate uh, with this is sort of at the low end uh, of that. Uh, it's a little low, but it's really uh, you know, at least in the ballpark. And we get a weak uh, mass dependence um, from the fit for the effective radius. Uh, uh, now, Leroy finds that the depletion time is actually a little bit lower for the low mass galaxies, uh, whereas we would have predicted the opposite. So that's this mass dependence is not in agreement with observation. So then I can go ahead and compare with the results of Linda et al. And um, so th they found a 1.6 years and, and went over the Hubble constant here. Uh, and here's our result to compare with. The fact that there's a slight difference in the exponent for the Hubble uh, parameter doesn't really matter because this really only varies by a factor of four or so, and four to the point one power is really a border unity. However, there is a significant difference because uh, uh, with this mass dependence, even though 0.18 is not a big power, uh, there are two decades of uh, uh, ma mass variation here, so that does lead to a factor of a little bit over a factor of two. Anyway, we're close, but we do have a mass uh, dependence. So there is an alternate formulation in the same uh, fantastic review article that uh, uh, TGS wrote. They actually then went ahead and presented a model, uh, and it's based on the uh, two-way time, which is Q times the orbital time instead of on the free-fall time. And they also, whereas we used uh, the observed uh, results for the uh, uh, radii, they use the Mo et al. theory, which uh, was discussed earlier. Uh, and so then they got some extra factors in their result. And this is uh, their result here. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, in approximate agreement with the, their uh, observations also. It has some parameters. That's epsilon t, I think, is just a, a parameter that you fit. And uh, then these various other factors here are uh, a little bit uncertain. But as in the case of the parameters I've introduced, those are things that can be improved with uh, more work. Okay, now 
it's independent of mass as observed, but that's only because this theory gives that the half mass radius goes like the virial radius, uh, which is then uh, m to the one third instead of the, the observed uh, 0.21. So um, it's related to our theory since, as uh, I just showed, the uh, free fall time goes like q over omega, which is like q t orbital, which is just what they assumed. And um, I would just point out that, as I had mentioned at the beginning, a distinction between the theories is that the free fall theory is uh, uh, based on the, uh, that this value of epsilon FF is set by turbulence in molecular clouds, which is a universal process. So the fact that it's a constant uh, makes some sense. OK, so there's a problem, which I've uh, started to to that the, uh, an observation uh, Arjun showed that the effective radius goes uh, with some, a power of the mass. I should say that he actually divided it up into different redshift bins and then from 0.18 to 0.25 we had, because we wanted one formula for everything and so we got an intermediate value of this power. And that means then that the angular velocity uh, is going to uh, depend on the mass uh, because you have an m over r cubed there. Okay, now, th theoretically, uh, Mo et al. related r one half to the virial radius, and that's going to vary as n to the one third. So what that means is that uh, if you do this, you naturally get the uh, angular velocity to be independent of the mass. So in both our model and the TGS model have the depletion time going inversely as this uh, rotation rate. So here's the conundrum. Our model uses the observed effective radius and gets an incorrect uh, uh, depletion time because uh, we have a mass dependence. Uh, TGS uses an incorrect uh, effective radius that does not agree with observation, but they get the correct dependence of the depletion time. And so um, this, uh, now, as I mentioned, this is not a, a huge problem. As Reinhard earlier today was talking about going into second order effects, I think you know both models at first order we're, we've sort of gotten it and we're in the right ballpark and now we're trying to get you know to, uh, next factor of two, uh, but uh, we're going to have to sort of understand some a better uh, basis on exactly how we're going to uh, resolve that. So in conclusion, um, as I've tried to emphasize, the depletion time is really a uh, key parameter in both tr uh, trying to understand the star formation rate and the evolution of galaxies. The uh, efficiency of the star formation rate for free fall time is set by the turbulence in molecular clouds. And it's a small constant uh, all the way from uh, giant molecular clouds in, our, in, in a galaxy, any galaxy, uh, all the way up to uh, whole galaxies, including starburst galaxies. Uh, this general galaxy generally self-regulates so that Q is of order unity. Uh, corresponding to, uh, that corresponds to the maximum mass being stabilized by uh, random motions being a little bit less than the minimum mass stabilized by rotation. So as a result, you have this local quantity, uh, the free fall time being related to a global quantity, the uh, rotation rate of the galaxy. Uh, using a fit to the data on galactic radii from uh, uh, Vanderbilt for paper 14, we found uh, this result for the uh, depletion time. And it's comparable to, but somewhat less than the observed uh, value from uh, the review by uh, uh, Taconi et al. And then uh, they presented a parallel multi-parameter uh, model. And uh, as I mentioned in this conundrum at the end, they use an incorrect radius and get the correct mass dependence of the depletion time, whereas we use the observed uh, mass dependence of the radius and get an incorrect uh, mass dependence for the uh, depletion time. And that is a problem that uh, I'll have to solve some in the future. So thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, questions for Chris? I'll start with Ariane. For thank you for a very interesting <laughs> talk. Um, I was wondering if the difference in radius of the gas disk and the stellar body could be a factor in maybe alleviate some tension between the two the TGS and your approach. And the other thing is the F star that might vary quite strongly with mass, right? At high mass, it's probably larger than a third. At low mass, it could be you know, very small. And that would change the tilt and the depletion time as a function of yeah, mass. So my uh, impression from your uh, graph that you presented earlier today was that the, um, the, the offset between 
the uh, half mass and the half light radius didn't really depend that much on mass, or did I misremember? No, that's correct. Yeah. The gas, the gas Yeah, that's true. And on that case, I'm relying uh, on this comment that was made, that Linda uh, made in, and they made in their review article, which is that uh, the gas radius, at least in their galaxies, is comparable to the stellar radius. It's certainly true when you come to z equals zero that then the gas, the scale height for the gas is often about twice the, uh, the stellar scale height. And uh, then for the, the fraction of mass in the stars, uh, as I said, I took that from this uh, article by uh, Woods et al. And the thing is that you have more gas at the high redshift, and as uh, Reinhardt showed, you sometimes get less dark matter, but there's still a lot of gas. Then at low redshift, we've used up all the, uh, the gas, but there's still uh, some dark matter, and there's more dark matter than there was. So it kind of averages out. I would agree, though, I think uh, certainly in the Milky Way, F star is more like a half, say, uh, than, than a third. So it would be larger. Okay, Chris, actually, I'm delighted um, <laughs> that we agree so well <laughs> to first order. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I think that's, that's a triumph, actually. I, I, don't, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't in any way register this as a, as, a, as, a, as a failure. Now, we've checked, of course, in the meantime, because uh, Linda told me that uh, maybe we've done a mis mistake of some sort. So I checked over lunch. Uh, with 2,000 galaxies empirically, what actually was the number? And the answer is indeed, if you, if you take all the 2,000 galaxies we have in the redshift range from zero to uh, about five, uh, where the highest redshifts are less uh, in number, uh, it's, it's sort of flat, it's flat, there is no trend. Now, having said this, if you look in some of our papers over time, there is and can be, in some of the data sets, a, a slope in M, M star, which, uh, which can be as large as 0.2. So in that sense, I'm delighted. When probably we're seeing a bit of you know, the, the sample uh, selection. And the next point I would make is exactly what Arjen just said. Uh, with, if, uh, with R effective, we have to be a little careful. Is that R5000? Uh, if, if so, then you have to correct for redshift and 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 is it mass versus, versus so there there are there are issues. But I think the the largest issue, which I think you have not touched on, <coughs> but is in the review, is the low mass behavior. So many people in the community, of course, uh, criticize the work which has been done the last 15 years on on all of these issues. Uh, by only because you know it, it, th that only the massive galaxies have been looked at, whilst of course in numbers uh, the the lower mass galaxies in that sense are more interesting. Our point was, and we made that point very clear in the in the uh, in the annual reviews uh, article that if assume that the mass dependence is small or not very, not very uh, important, then you can actually extrapolate, if you know the star formation rate in the, in the universe, to the total story of depletion time and all of this, which is a tremendous uh, step forward because it is not possible to get at the molecular gas content of any galaxy with less than half solar. And anyone who is saying, well, you have a biased sample, please take that into account. There is no magician, neither with dust, nor CO, who knows how to correct the conversion factor at 0.1 solar. And in the, HS, in, sorry, in the JWST era now, this is going to be a, a nightmare if people are trying to, to uh, play around with this. There is no correction factor because the, the, you can't see the molecule. Uh, it's not, the, you know, it's there in form of H2, but not in form of CO. So I'm delighted. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We have time for one more question, Robert. And then maybe Alvaro, you can start. Okay, it's a simple question. So um, if I understand correctly, right, you calculate the depletion time for molecular gas only, right? And, uh, but I think in your, f in your first equation, you use the total gas surface density to calculate the pressure. So my question is, um, if you take into account that you have a, um, a change in the H1 to H2 fraction as a function of stellar mass, could that help maybe perhaps with this 
let's say, wrong stellar mass dependence that you find in your model? Yeah, well, the thing is that, the, uh, as you uh, pointed out, I did use the total surface density of the gas, because that's really what determines the, the pressure that's acting oh, on the molecular gas. But that all canceled out. So in the final uh, ex ex expressions, the, the, that uh, didn't enter. So uh, thank you very much, Joel. OK, right.